Okay, I think we're going to start. Welcome. Uh, I'm Joe Heidhouse. I'm the, uh, uh, the co-director of the Environmental Fellows Program. Uh, and I've taught here for longer than most of you have been alive. Um, so, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this Earth Week celebration, where we'll soon hear from Ian Daniel, DePaul class of 04, who has gone on, an amazing, on to an amazing career as a filmmaker, an Emmy-nominated producer, and has been named a Distinguished Ash Fellow at Harvard University. Ian, the, uh, Ian is the former co-host and executive producer of the Emmy-nominated TV show, Gaycation, along with actor Elliot Page, with whom he also co-directed the film, There's Something in the Water, that he'll be talking about tonight. In our Environmental Fellows First Year Seminar, we've talked about this film. And we spent a lot of time considering environmental injustice and environmental racism. We've learned many times over that our human-caused environmental disasters disproportionately affect the poor, the black, the brown, and the indigenous populations of the world. We recently read an article with a line that has been haunting me. I'll paraphrase it. It takes a tremendous amount of political work to transform a sick body into a political fact. I think Ian's film and the words he speaks tonight are a part of this kind of work. As we talked at breakfast about his upcoming time at Harvard, it became clear that he's a perfect Earth Month speaker for, De for students at DePaul struggling to figure out for themselves what's next. From the time he was at DePaul, he has mixed a very wandering spirit. Even at DePaul, he, is, he studied in Paris, did internships in New York and LA. The list of places this guy's been is I can't say, it's too, too long. But he's mixed that wandering spirits with an intense ambition to learn anything. Acting, art, curation, film production, hosting, directing, and now policy change at Harvard. There, he'll equip himself further to combat, co combat environmental injustice. He'll be doing the hard work to transform sick bodies and burdened communities into political facts. As Ian has come back to DePaul, I want to use this introduction as well to let him and you know that we don't forget you. While I didn't have Ian in class, others remember him well. Professor of Global French Studies, uh, <laughs> Uh, Professor Klaus, I'll, I'll try not to parody her voice, but it's very excitable, um, uh, said this, I did have Ian in a French class. We had watched a film, Les Visiteurs, a French film where a couple of 12th century knights get transported to the present, well, 1993, and hilarious antics ensue. The goofier of the knights, played by Christian Clavier, a character called Jacquille La Fruquille, keeps noticing how modern French people say, OK, all the time. So he starts to say it, too. After we watched the movie, writes, writes Carrie, Ian began to do the same thing. So whenever I think of Ian, I hear him saying, OK. Okay, okay. And it still makes me laugh. I'll just say that, that, that that's the weird way we remember you. We remember like one, one class where you sort of like sort of shined, but somehow it gets weirdly imprinted in our memories. Uh, I remember students from 20 years ago, and I can remember where they sat in the room and that one weird anecdote, you know? Anyway. Finally, I want to thank Amber Hecko, Assistant Director of Environmental Fellows Program, 
working in tandem with our campus director of sustainability, Claire Dorner, in coordinating this event and the film showing and the many events of Earth Month. Tonight's talk is sponsored by the Media Fellows Program, the Environmental Fellows Program, the Office of Sustainability, Film Studies, and the Native American Indigenous Peoples Association, whose representative, DePauw Sr., Holly Buchanan, will deliver, who will deliver a land acknowledgement now. Hi, everyone. My name is Holly Buchanan. Um, Joe said I'm a senior here, departing president of NAPA, and a member of the Miami Nation of Indiana. So I wanted to give a land acknowledgement while I'm here. So this event acknowledges that DePauw University is located on the ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people, and it carries traditional and personal importance, particularly for the Piankisha, Wea, Miami, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Shawnee, Lenape, and other tribes that call these lands home. Pre-European contact, Indiana was also home to the Adena, Hopewell, and Mississippian cultures, which developed into these communities that we know of today. Many Indiana nations developed strong trade alliances um, with European nations such as France and Britain and built power from that despite disputes. However, with the growth of the um, creation of the U.S. government in the late 1700s, wars such as the War of 1812, uh, treaties that were broken, and the Indian Removal Act, um, they all had devastating effects on Indiana's indigenous communities and indigenous communities across the U.S. in general, many of which were forced off of their homelands into reservations in the north and west. However, some parts of the communities did remain in Indiana, and today Indiana is home to many Native people, and those tri part of the tribes that were since removed um, from Indiana still maintain connections to the homeland here. The original inhabitants of Indiana upon contact today are recognized as both federally and state-recognized tribal communities. Please acknowledge the sacred ground on which we stand and recognize indigenous sovereignty here and abroad. We urge you to support um, indigenous communities on this land and across the nation as they work to preserve or recover their land, cultures, and traditions of dispossession. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I do not remember that story you told, but it sounds right, maybe. Um, so do random things and your teachers might remember you is the lesson of that story, but um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you for that intro. I was moved and um, I've been moved this whole time by being back at DePaul, walking around where everything is so different yet somewhat similar. <laughs> But I've been reminiscing a lot about my time here, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I just want to thank, um, I want to thank everyone for being here in person. I know that COVID has taken the campus by, by storm, and I know it takes a lot to want to get back out. So I think I'm, I think I'm one of the first speakers back after COVID. So I, I hold the honor high. Um, and just thanks for taking the time, and thanks to everyone who is watching at home or online. I appreciate you showing up as well, and thank you to uh, thank you to the Media Fellows Program, the Environmental Fellows Program, the Office of Sustain Sustainability, the Film Studies, and the Native American and Indigenous Peoples Association, and DePaul for having me today. Um, and thank you to Amber Hecko, Marilyn Cooler, and I think Claire Dorner as well for organizing my, my time here. Um, and thank you so much, Holly, for the land acknowledgement. And I know that took your association a lot of work to get the approvals from the different nations and. Um, and we, we really appreciate the time and the energy. Um, and I just want to say that um, truth and acknowledgement are critical to building the mutual respect and connection across barriers and heritage of difference. So as Holly was saying, we acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth that our country was born out of in inhumane offenses of colonialism, slavery, and genocide. And this has been reinforced over generations by policy as well, which we will talk about more today. Um, but the truth acknowledgement must also then, sorry, one second, um, must then be paired with action from ourselves and from the institution. And I think that looks like, um, uh, sorry, uh, 
repairs by that support indigenous peoples and other minoritized and marginalized communities, advocates for practices of indigenous cultural revitalization, land back and restoration, and enhancing indigenous sovereignty. sovereignty. Indiana means uh, land of the Indian, Indian land after all, so all land is indigenous land. And as Holly shared, these communities are still here, practicing their cultures despite dispossession and ongoing colonialism, and it's important to connect uh, w with people from the land here. Um, I also want to stress then the importance of educating ourselves on the history that has brought you to live on this land and the place and your place in it. Uh, the Sagorate Land Trust, an indigenous way, uh, indigenous led, women led in San Francisco Bay, uh, that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indi indigenous peoples, lays this out as a place to start, which I thought I would read today. How do I? Think about your relationship to the colonial occupation of this land and answer these questions. What is your relationship to this history? Who are the indigenous people on the land you're on? How did you get here? What are, the what are your, your ancestral lands? What are the indigenous names of the people, territory, plants, and animals? What are the ind indigenous people of the land now? Where are they? What can you do to support them? What historical harms have you benefited from? Now, what does it mean to heal and transform the legacy of colonization, genocide, and patriarchy our ancestors and future generations are calling us to do? Because the fight for a healthier planet is inextricably bound up with indigenous rights and black and marginalized people's liberation across sectors and ecosystems. It's their leadership that is charting the way toward a just and sustainable and beautiful future. And that's what we're gonna talk more about today. Um, and just a little bit more about my story. I was once a DePaul student, and um, I have not been back here since I graduated in 2004. That was my final day here. And uh, I was a communications major, a French minor, and I had my own radio show on WGRE. I was a media fellow, uh, and the media fellow program uh, gave me the opportunity to get an internship at the Today Show. And all of that really did help me in my path to become a documentarian, and it, it helped me be a better producer, to be honest. And for about 15 years now, I've worked in creative nonfiction storytelling in many different mediums, now mostly as a director and a producer, reporter, and sometimes host in social issue documentary, which is mainly committed to uniting people through civic engagement and community building. And I think my interests are in how communities work, uh, how they break, and what mends them. My commitment to social justice, I think, is rooted in my own upbringing, which is uh, growing up queer and poor in southern Indiana. I'm from Washington and, and Vincennes, Indiana. Uh, my mother worked nights as an ER nurse to keep us above the welfare line. My grandmother nearby was a brilliant poet and an artist and taught me storytelling and ways to empower through compassion. All of the women in my life instilled a fierceness to lift myself and to lift everyone around me, and they are central to my thriving, that is for sure. To be queer in our conservative town, it could be a death sentence. Uh, the pain of hiding could definitely kill you too. In fact, two of my classmates from high school have killed themselves. And I, I, that, that's just always been sitting with me in my work because there was so little to no representation of LGBT people on television. One gay character changed my life, honestly. I think it was like on the real world, there was one gay guy. And it, that just, it, just seeing one person did so much for me. And, um, and I make work now to combat our society's refusals of visibility, driven by the core belief that sharing our stories can keep us alive, connected, and thriving. I co-created and co-hosted a show called Gaycation, an LGBT travel docu-series with the actor Elliot Page at Vice TV. That was a response to the low representation of LGBT people and trans people that we saw on screen. It became an in-depth exploration of queer cultures and communities within the context of global politics in eight different countries. I was, on making that show, I was in awe every day of ordinary people making extraordinary change. Um, and I think I was, so fortunate to be around a multitude of resistance efforts and communities making great uh, shifts in their communities and, and in the world, really. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that sense. And 
In all, in that work, I found that today's social justice movements need powerful stories as much as they need grassroots organizing, leadership, and policy to motivate action and unite causes. And I've made the most impact, honestly, by bridging documentary work with grassroots organizers, environmentalists, academics, politicians, scientists, nonprofits, celebrities, all working together to change what is unjust. So it's necessary, it's kind of my big statement today, it's necessary to transcend our disciplinary boundaries, come together in our talents and our expertise to create more intersectional solutions to the world's toughest problems. And one issue that is interlocking all the communities that I'm part of or that I work with is climate change. And that's why we're here to talk about uh, indigenous, black, brown, rural, and queer, disabled, and low-income communities are on the front lines of the climate disaster. They're most erased, but they hold the true solutions. And if you are not on the front lines of climate change right now, you soon will be, it looks like. Uh, my most recent work focuses on bringing more attention to and combating the climate crisis, negative health impacts on racialized and marginalized communities perpetuated in long-standing and newly written racist policies, and highlighting examples of how climate solutions are inherently linked to all other social and racial justice solutions. Uh, in 2019, I developed the documentary, I developed the documentary, There's Something in the Water, directly with the communities that it aimed to help, along with the top scholar on environmental racism in Canada, Dr. Ingrid Waldron. Uh, we explore envi environmental racism in indigenous and black communities in Canada by mapping out how policy decisions affect generations of historical communities along racialized lines and how they often are left out of conversations impacting their communities. We were invited by the women on the front lines of these local movements um, into their community to find a pathway together to get maximum attention to their efforts that had been in place for so many years. And together we did make actual change to local policy. Clean water started to pour into these communities. Um, and I'm here to report really some really positive news from those communities. I will say I am no scholar, obviously, on these issues. Um, but my film work has created a space for deep listening and learning. And that's what I'm here to share, all of that expertise from the field, from these communities. And a lot of the work from Dr. Ingrid Waldron has inspired me, and I'll, I'll share some of that more today. The, the women that I filmed with, they reminded me of the deep intelligence in our Earth and how vital it is to find all the ways to listen to what it's saying. And so I've been thinking a little bit, what is the story of Earth going to tell us today on its day, its big day, its Earth Day? What are you saying? Um, and I was driving in from the airport, and I've been so kind of holed up in Brooklyn and away from nature and mostly around concrete and a lot of other beautiful things. But um, I, I just was again, mesmerized by the landscape here, which I know sounds bizarre if you're in it all the time, but it's spring and, and things are blooming and it's just quite beautiful. So I imagine, I reimagined some of my speech, which was more the, yes, there's so many beautiful things happening on our planet, but also I think we know, and what we're here to really focus on is the earth's kind of saying that it's hurting. Um, it's, it's in great pain. Uh, I want to, if you want to look at the really bright side of things, the honest truth is we are in a climate catastrophe. Beyond the tipping point, hundreds of Western scientists are officially saying, and while the gravity of the climate crisis has been tirelessly called out by indigenous and frontline communities for centuries. Just a couple of weeks ago, the IPCC report from the UN released its uh, apocalyptic report offering a stark warning. Serious impacts of global warming are now unavoidable. Very quickly, we're approaching a point where we cannot reverse the damage we've done to our Earth, and it will only be us adapting to climate disasters. It re it, the report finds that greenhouse gas emissions from 2010 to 2019 were at their highest level in human history. Very soon, average global temperatures will be warmer than 1.5 degrees which is the marker for causing more and more intense extreme weather events, which we're already seeing. The end result of endless fossil fuel expansion under an extractive economy, unrestricted corporate and financial greed, and government inaction. 
The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the findings a code red for humanity. Green, greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet, and they're putting billions of people at immediate risk, he said. It also said that if there's any hope, actions must be taken by governments, the private sector, and you in tandem with real urgency. Scientists, in fact, were blockading government buildings all around the world, demanding that President Joe Biden declare a climate emergency to unlock tools needed and to ramp up transitions to clean energy. The report also identifies uh, the report also identifies population displacement and lost livelihoods as key impacts of this increase. Well, that they they will have. Sorry, identifies a lot of displacement from vulnerable populations. The, cri the crisis especially is affecting indigenous brown, black people and women from the global south and children who bear an even heavier burden from the impacts of climate change due to interlocking effects of colonialism, racism, and gender inequity. They are disproportionately vulnerable to the climate crisis because they're more likely to be exposed to pollution from industry near their homes, and they live in areas first hit hard, first and hardest hit by storm surges, rising sea levels, and floods, and intense heat waves throughout wildfire, poor air quality. So if you listen to US land anywhere, the story you'll hear is one of discrimination against discrimination against extraction at the expense of and efforts to systematically displace and erase its original peoples whose ancestors have been here long before European colonialism. Climate change started with European colonialism, with the near extermination of indigenous peoples throughout the colonized world, exacerbated by the removal of tens tens of millions of Africans from the continent to the European colonies through the Atlantic slave trade, which gave us the most brutal version of chattel slavery that the world's ever seen. Racialized, inheritable, hypodescendant enslavement on forced slave labor concentration camp plantations and a larger ethnic cleansing agenda created the cultural value system that is causing the catastrophe that we're all experiencing today. Many communities on the ground are still living through the remnants of colonialism, fighting forms that it has evolved into, like loss of land resources, human rights violations. And those communities have been saying colonialism caused climate change. And also, the other side of the story, indigenous rights and traditional knowledge are the solution to this. 30 years later, the IPC report is also finally acknowledging this. The climate crisis has its roots in racism, and the solution lies then in anti-racism work on all of our parts. Climate justice is racial justice. While indigenous communities are the key stakeholders in the climate response, they, long, they have long held, led resistance against pollution generating industries, and they work to protect biodiversity with ancestral practices rooted in interdependence uh, with nature and with the earth. Researchers now recommend bringing indigenous people and their perspectives front and center in, in environmental action. And women in these communities, too, are the backbone of the movements, actively challenging old paradigms. And these movements for change are most impactful when the youth are involved. And I like what Uplift is saying. It's a group of young climate activists from many different cultures, and they share their vision. Our interpretation of climate justice comes largely from the visions and climate justice work of frontline communities. We dream of land that is healthy, habitable for the more than human world, and free from colonial exploitation and ownership. Through creative grassroots organizing, we foster a livable future with clean air, clean water, renewable energy, regenerative food systems, and liberated peoples. We transcend capitalistic economic systems and create ways of being that center equitable communities, deep relationships, and a healthy earth in this future. Everyone has access to play, pleasure, healing, and authenticity. And these are some of the issues that we focused on in our film, There's Something in the Water showing the mechanics and human faces of environmental destruction in Nova Scotia, Canada's indigenous and black communities that were targeted by conglomerates for use as waste sites. And the intention was to let the communities lead and to support their movements through multimedia, uh, through multimedia and our platforms. So maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a good idea to give a little bit of the story about how the film came to be. This is, postcards from Nova Scotia. 
Um, it's not clear. Elliot Page and I are good friends and we're creative partners. We make vacation together. In 2017, Elliot was back in his hometown in Nova Scotia, Canada. And he saw a book called The Mill, 50 Years of Pulp and Protest by Joan Baxter, an investigative reporter, sitting on his friend's kitchen table. Picked it up, read it in days, and called me to talk about the devastation and corruption that he was reading about in his hometown. We often do talk about issues that are really impacting us and that we think we should put our attention toward, and this was really high on Elliot's list. So I was obviously really listening. And in that book, it, it mapped out the story of Boat Harbor, which considered one of the worst cases of environmental racism of the Mi'kmaq community members in Picto Landing First Nation. And I know that some of you have watched the film uh, and the, that some of the classes are screening the film. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it, some of you, tomorrow. So I'm going to repeat some of the stories so that people who have not seen the film will know what we're talking about. And it's just a good reminder. And this story details decades of foreign corporations that owned a local pulp mill and how they influenced provincial and federal authorities to poison and destroy indigenous land and water. Boat Harbor, originally known as Asik, is a beautiful estuary on, indigenous, on an indigenous reserve, once a fertile hunting and fishing ground, and also a sacred burial ground. In the 1960s, a craft pulp mill was wanting to build Scott Paper Mill, paper company, nearby, and the Nova Scotia government signed on to agree to taking responsibility of the mill's toxic effluent. The Mi'kmaq land was targeted. The elders were lied to about the damage that the dumping of the toxins would cause. The community was paid $60,000, hoping that would bring in more resources and jobs. A contract was signed, and the effluent started to pour into Asik. As you see, that was Asik going out into the North Umberland Strait. And overnight, the beauty of Asik quickly turned into a nightmare as the waters were polluted with mercury and toxic heavy metals. All aquatic life died, and 30 acres of reserve land was flooded, turning it into a toxic site, impacting the air, water, and soil. The mill switched hands to Northern Pulp, who for decades had been dumping billions of liters of untreated contaminants there, creating considerable ecological and health costs including the high, third highest cancer rates per capita in Canada's health districts, and very serious respiratory disease. The community fought for decades to get it shut down and to have their land returned and repaired. Despite repeated promises, the government also failed to address contamination in Boat Harbor until recently. Elliot and I met with Michelle Francis Denny, a community leader there, and her grandfather was the chief who signed the contract to allow the effluent to flow on the land. And I'm going to show a clip from our film. Bear with me for... I mean, this is the old school way. <laughs> it's like my days at DePaul. Uh. Let's see. It's to be broken. What would life be like for my family if Lord Harbor didn't happen? My grandfather and my grandmother had 13 kids. My grandfather passing away at a very, you know, very young, late 40s. Um, right now, to this day, my mother is still living and my aunt. All others have been lost to cancer, to suicide. You know, alcoholism and drugs, you know, took a driver's seat. So I often wonder, if this didn't happen, will we had a chance to live in a way where we could grow old together. I'll be taking you guys out to see the excellent treatment facility uh, over at Simpsons Lane, just not far from our community. 
This is the entrance to the treatment facility that's been here since 1967. This is what is directly coming out of the mill. Raw, untreated effluent. That used to dump directly into onto our land. There was no like true consistent for it, so the pipe just used to dump. I get so sad I'm down here. buildings and our homes and you feel that like it just sticks to the walls these are the aerators that they're supposed to be giving oxygen to the water which is fairly sad but uh, back in the day when they said that it would have no impact this is what we're left with Um, all this is uh, blown over into our community. So not only are we suffering knowing that, you know, this exists to our water, I said, look at our air as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. It's so funny that you mentioned that, because, uh, just knowing, you know, where I came from and, you know, the family that's gone before me and I, I've never expected to live long. I'm, I'll be 41, you know, next week. And knowing that, you know, everybody, you know, passed away so young. Um, I, I had always felt that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to get a chance to grow old. And sometimes I think that way. Grief. And I say that word a lot because I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> it takes many forms. It's, it's, you know, how do you cope with this? How would you cope with this? Was that a concern of yours that the, the lagoon was so close to, a, to the Indian Reserve? Or a person to join in the many harm. They, they weren't in the water. They weren't living in the water. They were living inside of the water. And uh, so what? Yeah, when I found that, when we found that video, it was just, I was not expecting to find live footage of someone saying the truth there. Uh, and we, the story from there is we met with Michelle, and then we connected with Michelle actually through professor and scholar on environmental racism, Ingrid Waldron. She was teaching at Dalhousie University at the time. She had just written a book called There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities. Elliot and I had read the book after reading The Mill. It had just come out uh, that year, the year before. And we reached, we, we had been, we reached out to her, Elliot reached out to her about her work and, and ways to get involved or just to talk. And that's really how this all started. At the time, Ingrid had been doing this community-based community research, multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral partnerships from, <clears throat> for some time with the Enrich Project that examines and addresses social, environmental, political, and health impacts of environmental racism and climate change in marginalized communities across Canada. Dr. Waldron's book intricately shares years of work and research that they did there and maps out multiple cases of environmental racism in Nova Scotia. 
At the same time that we were having conversations with Dr. Waldron, another group of Mi'kmaq women called the Grassroots Grandmothers, just miles away from Boat Harbor in a town called Stuyak, were at the same time leading a full-on resistance movement there, setting up camp to oppose the development of a brine discharge pipeline next to the Shubenacadie River where they lived where they lived from a, uh, blocking a corporate natural gas company. They were asking for support and getting more attention there. They had talked to Ingrid and then they were also talking to us about ways that we could put more focus on their story. Altagas at the time was starting a con Struct was starting construction, sorry, to store their natural gas in salt caverns that they found near the Shubenacadie River on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. In order to store the gas, they had to dissolve the cavern salt deposits with water from the river and then dump that salt water mixture back into the river, which is up to 3,000 tons every day. And that carries salinity levels six times higher than what's considered safe for fish, threatening life within, threatening all life within the river. Failure rates actually for these kinds of projects have been really high in the United States, 65% failure rate, with lots of risk of explosions and leaks and emissions from poisonous chemicals. So the water, as you, it was pumping out here into the river and back, back in, so the, there were just tons of debris and salt potentially going to be dumped in their river. In 2014, the local resistance had actually halted the project, but it resu the project resumed in 2016 after Alta Gas was given environmental approvals for permits by the Nova Scotia government. Resistance then grew even stronger with the Mi'kmaq community arguing they were not adequately, adequately consulted, had not given consent to the project, were provided with little to no choice about public meetings, and they said the government had ignored their treaty rights. The water protectors created a treaty truck house outpost along the river where they were resisting and blocking Alton gas activity there. A few phone conversations with Ingrid and the grandmothers, they recommended that we come up with cameras. They had seen some of our work on geekation, and I think they just really felt like any more attention in the media would help them. Um, we, it was very urgent. We decided that together that producing short videos would be the way to go and put them online and also would highlight the systemic issues involved. So two weeks later in mid-April 2019, Ellie and I rented some cameras, came up to Nova Scotia to capture footage and talk with the leaders of the community resistance there and let them lead us. And I was telling people at dinner, I am not a cinematographer. Um, I have made films, but I was really learning on the fly and doing the audio recording and producing. We were a small team of people, and that, I think, affected how much access we were able to get in the communities. It really impacted the intimacy of the stories. And I'm sometimes still shocked that it's a film that was on Netflix. Some of the cinematography is a little shaky, but that's OK. <laughs> we were not prepared. Um, but through Ingrid, we learned that this was happening all over Nova Scotia in indigenous and black and poor communities. So as we say in the film, if you look at a map of Nova Scotia and you point out the plots of land where black and indigenous communities are, and then you point out where toxic industries are located, a chilling correlation becomes very clear. Like the Mi'kmaq people too, African Nova Scotians were experiencing similar systemic discriminations. Shelburne County once had the highest population of freed black people in North America. Their descendants now living mostly in the south end of Shelburne now majority black neighborhood, which is the only area in Shelburne without access to the town's drinking water supply. A landfill, or as the residents call it, a dump, was placed there in the town in the 1940s that's continued to ha haunt residents there years after it was closed. The dump was the site of industrial and medical and residential waste from eastern Shelburne County for 75 years. Some homes were within 200 feet of the dump. Most homes were situated downhill from the dump and those homes use underground well waters for drinking water. While the dump was closed in the early 1990s, it was used as a transfer station for appliances and empty oil barrels until 2000, 2016. So we met with Louise DeLille, a community leader who lives around the corner from the dump, who in her youth, uh, the dump would be set on fire and they'd have to shelter inside. Toxins produced from the wait site over the years they claim may have been released into the air, water, and land, posing a long-term risk to health and environment nearby. Luis had been really concerned about the long-term health impacts of the dump, of living so close to it. 
When, other, when one of the neighbors dies of cancer, she records it in her own database, and there are a lot of entries. And in the film, she shows that close proximity to the dump, many in close proximity to the dump, they have died from cancer, or they're suffering from an array of other health problems. Luis lost her brother to stomach cancer, her father to prostate cancer, and her mother to breast cancer and a, and a blood disorder. Several other relatives have been diagnosed with or have died from various cancers, and she believes this is because of the legacy of the toxic dump. The community is also concerned, have been concerned that the leachate from the dump is leaking into the well water naturally, and they've been long fighting with the local government there to build a community well for clean water in the area. The local government at the time we were making the film and after was continually denying their request. With the film, the point was to really pressure the public and politicians in each of these cases into action to explore the history of that in institutionalized racism, racism and show the human face health impacts of racist policies and to also inform future legislation. Excuse me, I've been talking all day long, so my voice is might go out here. I will let Dr. Waldron from the film explain environmental racism. Environmental racism is the condition, is a problem of disproportionate exposure of indigenous communities, black communities, other communities of color to environmental burdens, to pollutants and contaminants. But it's also about the slow response by government, right, to address uh, these issues. What we know is that where you live has bearing on your well-being. The Canada, your postal code determines your health. So we know that certain communities are less healthy because of where they live. Most African Nova Scotians live in historical African Nova Scotian communities, which are rural communities, and many of them are narrow landfills. And we know indigenous communities as well are the ones that tend to be disproportionately located near to these hazardous uh, sites. When you're living in out of the way, invisible, communities that often lack a voice, that are invisible to government, um, then often your voice isn't heard. You have to look at environmental racism within the context of the history of Nova Scotia, within the context of colonialism in Nova Scotia and Canada. There is a reluctance, a hesitance in Canada to name racism. Racism embeds itself into all of our social structures and in Canada we tend to steer clear of that. Racism and environmental racism have real impacts on the ground uh, with respect to these particular uh, communities. It has impacted black and indigenous communities socially, economically, and politically. When you look at particular communities as not being worthy, of having no humanity, of uh, not being valuable, which is how we typically think of non-white peoples, then it makes sense in many ways that, that you're not going to respond in a similar way as you would with a white community because these communities don't mean anything uh, to you, to individuals. So I think there's a detachment if you're not taking time to meet communities and get a sense of their priorities, their experiences, their challenges will never get written into environmental policy. It requires that you listen to these communities and that's typically uh, what's not happening. This is the definition that's on uh, Ingrid's Enrich site and comes from scholar Dr. Boulard as well. And in Ingrid's book, she notes 
She talks a lot about the structural determinants of health, such as low educational attainment, unemployment, income insecurity, poverty, that compromises compromises community members' capacity to fight back against the placement of harmful industries in their neighborhoods. And those intersect in ways that make the communities more vulnerable to environmental illnesses and disease. Hop Hopkins from the Sierra Club is sharing really great work and writing to show how racism fuels this climate crisis. He points out in an article that he wrote, racism is killing the planet. Big polluters really are relying on the silence and the collusion of white Americans, he says. Devaluing black and indigenous people's lives to build wealth for white communities is not new. European invaders began that project in the 15th century when they arrived in North America. And that white supremacy has evolved over generations. And today, it looks a lot like environmental racism. The fossil fuel industry is extractive, and it's not possible without the contamination of Earth in mostly marginalized communities. It needs sacrifice zones. You can't have these sacrifice zones without disposable people. Deeming people disposable happens through racism and white supremacy. I really like what Resma Menicum, the author of My Grandmother's Hands, he defines white supremacy, or body, white body supremacy, as he calls it. White supremacy and all the claims and accusations, excuses and dodges that surround it are a trauma response. This response lives not inside psyches, but deep within bodies. In fact, more accurate term for the affl affliction is white body supremacy, since it elevates the white body above all other bodies. The white body is the ostensibly supreme standard against which white, in which other bodies, humanity is measured, he says. No matter, what, no matter what we look like, if we were born and raised in America, white body supremacy and our adaptations to it are in our blood. Our very bodies house the unhealed dissonance and trauma of our ancestors. This is why white body supremacy continues to persist in America and why so many African Americans continue to die from it. This not only harms people with dark skin. If you're a white American, your body is probably inherited a different legacy of trauma that affects white bodies. And this goes back centuries, at least as far back as the Middle Ages, and has been passed down from one white body to another for dozens of generations. White bodies traumatized each other in Europe for centuries before they even encountered black and red bodies. This carnage and trauma profoundly affected white bodies and their expression of their DNA. This historical trauma is closely linked to the development of, a white, body, of white body supremacy in America. So talking about historical trauma, race is a story that humans created. Whiteness was created by the European colonial elite, elite as a con to convince their lower classes to leave their homelands of thousands of years and immigrate to the colonies to populate and defend and do the grunt work of the colonies by promising them a way to class up out of their peasant status into whiteness, where they will now be a class above all those now branded non-white. This then developed in the Americas over, 100, over hundreds of years, where people who have called themselves white have created a cultural value system of settler colonial terrorism against people that we now call non-white. Hop Hopkins wrote, let me be clear. Folks who identify as white don't need to end white supremacy for people who look like me. You all need to end it for yourselves and ask yourself, what have been the internal costs of complicity with white supremacy? And how has that affected your own humanity? When you come to see and understand these intersections between white supremacy and environmental destruction, you'll find yourself at a crossroads, and that crossroads will force you to decide what side you're on. And I agree with him that, I agree with him that any failure to act in solidarity is ultimately just self-destructive. As we see with the IPC, IPCC report, white privilege offers no escape from the climate crisis and devastation. And this is how it's impacting the US a little bit. Black people in a marginalized community shoulder a disproportionate burden of the nation's pollution, with, with, which scientists and policymakers have known for decades. A 2017 report from the double, uh, NAACPA, in double, sorry, NAACP showed that African Americans are 75% more likely than other Americans and Latinos 60% 60 greater to live in so-called fence line communities. Black Americans are subjected to higher levels of air pollution than white Americans. Black Americans with higher income are exposed to more toxic air than white Americans with lower incomes. According to new research from a team led by the University of Washington, 
and the University of Minnesota, black Americans breathe 38% more polluted air than white Americans in terms of residential outdoor nitrogen oxide. Black Americans and Latinos bear a disproportionate burden of pollution caused by whites. Black Americans and Latinos breathe in 50%, 56% and 63%, respectively, more pollution than they generate. White people, on the other hand, breathe 17% less pollution than they cause. One example, a well-known example, is Cancer Alley in southern Louisiana. It's an 85-mile-long area in the lower Mississippi. It was once the site of cornfields and sugarcane plantations. It's now an industrial hub since the 1980s, with nearly 150 oil refineries, plastic plants, chemical facilities, still home to some 20,000 people, a majority black. This narrow corridor absorbs more toxic substances annually than most of the enti most of entire states and has, pol the, has polluted the surrounding water and air. According to an EPA EJ screen tool, nearly every census tract between Baton Rouge and New Orleans has higher cancer risk from toxic pollution than 95% of the country. And even in Indiana, here's an example, which maybe many of you have heard about, I'm not sure, in northern Indiana of a Superfund site, which is designated to have long, need long-term response to cleanup of hazardous materials. This is a symbol of how American industry disproportionately affects the health of minoritized and low-income communities as East Chicago, Indiana. The city has hosted dozens of refineries, coal plants, and industrial facilities. The majority of the 30,000 residents were black or, black or Hispanic, 18% identified as disabled, nearly a third living below the poverty line. Those homes that were built in the 1960s and 1970s were built, on a, uh, were built in the 1960s and 70s, and a lead smelting plant operated in the area up until 1985. And other lead refineries were there as well. The Indiana Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights, they had a report regarding the civil rights concerns of lead poisoning in Indiana's children. They cited Chicago as the most extreme example of lead contamination in Indiana. Despite growing awareness about the lead's harmful impact there, the West Columet housing, public housing complex was constructed on the former site of the Anaconda Land and Refinery in 1972, which produced highly toxic ingredients used in lead paint. Although testing for the lead had begun years earlier, residents were not notified of this until 2016, after the Superfund designation. And after letting pollution linger there for decades, nearly 1,200 people in the housing complex learned that their children's blood carried levels of lead that tested as much as six times higher than the Center for Disease Control's cutoff for lead poisoning, which leads to a host of physical and psychological issues. Cities of, city officials were close. City officials forced residents to move, but they neglected to provide them with housing, and residents were informed they had only 60 to 90 days to to vacate due to lead contamination, and some ended up without homes or relocating to violent neighborhoods. And the housing, the housing has since been torn down. And these are all over Indiana. I can send you a website. The EPA has a website actually where you can put in your zip code and find out where these are. And there's a lot of similar circumstances that are happening here. I won't go into all of that at this moment. Um, there, are in, there are cases of environmental racism, racism happening all over the United States. And for Native American nations in the Western United States, more than 600,000 Native people live within six miles of an abandoned mine. There are 21 super, fight, super, sites, super fun sites in New Mexico. And an EPA's uh, national priorities list claims this, the result of nuclear legacy in New Mexico, including uranium mining. The greater Chaco region of northwest New Mexico, which you see here, a landscape sacred to the Diné people and the part of the Navajo Nation, was once a center for uranium mining, is today a hot spot for oil and gas production. The mines in the area have now closed, but indigenous communities are battling the legacy that continues to impact their health there and continue to to oppose new oil and gas drilling and advocate for community con protections and tribal consultation. The federal government offers little help, offers a lot of help to a lot other communities that are dealing with and coping with effects of climate change, but Native Americans have often been less able to access that help, and they are the very least funded in that help. And what's more is that due to this institutional patriarchy, sexism, male-dominated power structures, this destruction disproportionately impacts women in these frontline communities, and they see an increase in gendered and sexual violence. 
The National Indigenous Women's Resource Center recent report, recent report talks a lot about this, that men come into these areas as transient workers in, in industry worker camps and they enact sexual, uh, rampant sexual violence. Compound, compound that with the marginalization of indigenous women who already experience grossly disproportionate high levels of violence and also a growing epidemic of indigenous women going missing and we have a severe problem. The center points out though that in spite, they say, in spite of in spite of the onslaught of assaults on and disregard for their traditions, lands, and people, courageous indigenous women, two spirits, and young people are continuing to gather, strategize, and heal. Every day they remember a sister who went missing, an aunt who was murdered, murdered, a mother who died of cancer, or a cousin who was driven off a road. They step forward as leaders, weaving the intersecting issues of indigenous sovereignty, environmentalism, feminism, reproductive health, youth rights, and anti-colonialism. These brave leaders are determined to transform this violence into protection and healing for all. And yes, this is also the remarkable stories that we heard of healing, of collective power, of community solidarity in our film. Although people across gender spectrum were involved, the frontline resistance in each community was typically led by women locally with impressive examples of solidarity between communities with white allies getting more and more involved as the pollution was affecting them. But they were all engaging in these anti-colonial, anti-capitalistic acts of resistance, non-violent acts, blockades, marches and beyond. And they were making big change there. Pictou Landing First Nation, as I was saying, they'd been actively opposing the mill for years that was dumping effluent into their harbor. There had been so many promises to stop the effluent from flowing since 1993, but in 2014, there were, there were local tensions came to a head when the mill's pipe broke, spilling 47 million liters of toxic, untreated effluent into the area on lands to be uh, known as sacred burial grounds, triggering a blockade from the community members. And this was the breaking point where big change started to happen. Chief Andrea Paul only dismantled Excuse me, Chief Andrea, only, Chief Andrea Paul only dismantled the protest after there was an agreement from the environment minister and Premier Stephen McNeil that they promised to shut down the Boat Harbor treatment area by January 2020, setting aside 52 million for remediation. But at the time the community, that we were there, the community was not certain that this was going to happen. They might continue to rescind their promises. And then with the grassroots grandmothers down the road, they had engaged in years of activities to halt the Alton gas project, including highway block aids, development of site encampment. They had a treaty truck house on the river, which became a gathering point for planning and educational activities. They held, and also where they held their sacred water and land ceremonies. And when the, when the province did not engage in meaningful consultation with them in 2016, they really started to protest and, and create demonstrations on these highways. And three men, women were eventually arrested in blockading the rural construction site. And in Shelburne, Luis has been at the forefront of the movement there for years and cultivating stronger community voice and a lot of systems of mutual aid. They created Rural Water Watch with Dr. Ingrid and geologists to equip the rural Nova Scotian community with knowledge, skills, and literacy, and resources to address their concerns about their drinking water, doing their own water sampling, and learning how to identify potential contaminants. Luis also banded together to create an organization called C to, to push for proper cleanup and closure of the landfill to conduct more studies on the ongoing health impacts of the landfill. They've been battling the local government to test the wells, to put in new wells, to build a community well, anything to get clean water, and all of that was not working with the local government. So nonviolent civil resistance, especially led by women, studies do show, is the most successful form of mass change today. Some cannot risk this as it is not without its cost. Water protectors are often arrested in 20 US states. Laws now criminalize par, uh, pipeline protesters. And in 2020, 218 land and environmental defenders were attacked or killed, often targeted by politicians and corporations, according, according to the climate justice organization, Global Witness, making it the most dangerous year on record for people defending their homes, land, and livelihood and ecosystems. So we made the film really to amplify all levels of these stories and the already successful local movements that were happening. We plan to put pressure on the government and corporations at critical moments in each of these communities. And 
one thing that I learned from Dr. Waldron is the adage that the head and the heart must go together. That this research, their research, these movements, they need storytellers, they need documentarians, they need multimedia approaches to get their research out of the books, out of the local arena, and into the hearts of public, of public, of the public. So after Ellie and I filmed there for 10 days in Nova Scotia, we showed Dr. Waldra and the footage, and we decided that we would have more impact if we made a feature film that could connect the dots of all these communities, not just videos. We knew that the government and corporations would not be moved to change, probably unless the public pressure was enough, massive enough, to make a real difference. So we decided to make a feature film and submit it to the Toronto Film Festival. It was just months away. And if we didn't move soon, the Alton Gas project that you saw might override the Mi'kmaq women's protest. So there was a lot of pressure to get this film out. Elliot funded the funded the effort out of his pocket, which made this possible. I built a creative team, and we consulted with the women all along the way. Months after filming, we got into TIFF, and the film premiered there. This was before COVID, and right before. And all the grassroots grandmothers, Michelle from Picto Landing, Dr. Walter and Luis from Shelburne came, and we were all able to talk at the screening, and it was a big success there. Audiences left the tip premiere really fired up. They wanted, people were asking me, how can I pay for the community well? How can I get involved? This momentum called for us to create real conduits for activated audiences. We did more showings at human rights film festivals, public screenings in rural areas, broader educational programming. Local leaders used the film as a tool. And then a tipping point really formed when the film came out on Netflix in 2020. Support and outrage grew to a more critical mass. And shortly thereafter, unprecedented decisions at the state and corporate level were made. For example, Michelle and Picto Landing, they saw a big win in 2020. After the, soon after the film premiered, Stephen McNeil did keep his word, and he announced that the closure of Boat Harbor after 50 years of dumping waste into their land would stop. Cleanup, cleanup efforts are on their way now. There are still some issues with waste being stored there, however. But these communities' saturated cancer rates might thin out as clean water flows in. And after decades of trials in 2020, the Supreme Court, over, uh, the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia ruled that the environmental, environmental minister did not properly consult the grassroots grandmothers and their community in improving the Alton Gas Project. Ordering the government, they ordered the government then to begin new consultations. That gave for, um, sorry, the First Nation community there then was given duty, given duty to consult over their land. The Supreme Court admitted that the core issue of Aboriginal title and treaty rights had never been successfully engaged, and this meant that the province must consult with First Nations on all future industrial approvals, which was a big deal. And in last October, 2021, the Alton Gas Pipeline Project announced that their natural gas storage project is dead. They are going to be decommissioning the salt caverns and cleanup is begin, has begun uh, immediately. That was a huge win for the community. Um, and in South Shelburne, an offer of $20,000 was made to put in a community well there, which is going to be built in the Nova Scotia Community College this summer. A lot of money was also donated from people watching the film that was used to dig up and put new wells in each home in South Shelburne near the dump. And I just spoke to Luis about how all that's coming. And then as of last week, actually, after years of residents screaming about their concerns not being heard, the new Shelburne mayor, Harold Locke, said that he would officially decommission and clean up the dump over the next five years, although residents there are not certain this will happen because they have not been consulted with. So we will see. So we all saw firsthand how film and media can tackle systemic problems and how policy makers can be at the mercy of these change making tools. Dr. Waldron told us policy will only change when people learn about and empathize with the issues. The documentary made people feel and in proportion the, pe and in proportion, the people in power paid attention. All across the US this resistance is happening in the fight against environmental racism offering real solutions to these problems that we've been discussing. Some quick examples in Chicago, activist Kim, oh, sorry. Activist Kim Wasserman, soon after she heard her, in Chicago, 
uh, soon after she heard her son was diagnosed with asthma, she formed a neighborhood coalition to petition the government and to prote protest the operation of two coal-fired coal power plants nearby. The one estimate contributed to having almost 3,000 deaths, creating 3,000 deaths since they opened in 1924. For 10 years, Wasserman fought to shut down the plants, and in 2012, the power company behind the plants shut down the facilities, and Wasserman's now in the process of converting that space into parks in the community. Donnell Wilkins, a pioneer in the environmental justice movement in Detroit, since the 80s lobbied to shut down a solid waste incinerator in the middle of Detroit that was burning trash from the city, but also from suburban and majority white neighborhoods linked to higher rates of cancer and respiratory issues, birth defects for decades. And finally, in 2019, the incinerator was closed for good. Uprose in Sunset Park, Brooklyn are an intergenerational, multiracial, women-led grassroots organization They've had so many successes organizing the largest gathering of young marginalized people on climate justice. They've actively stopped the siting of power plants in their community, doubled the amount of open space in Sunset Park, and they are constructing New York State's first solar uh, community solar project on top of the Brooklyn Army, Army Terminal. Again, I will say all successful movements have had strong youth and student organization. It is essential to have your voices involved. You use innovative tactics to fight for justice. There tends to be a value of intersectionality between movements. You center frontline community leadership. You, you know, the general youth, um, resist and unlearn colonial patterns of dominance. And they, the youth have really a strong, these youth leaders have strong visions for a world where all are free from oppression. If, for example, the Sunrise Movement, they did a hunger strike on the White House recently um, against Joe Biden, trying to keep Joe, hold Joe Biden accountable for keeping climate justice, climate policies in the Build Back Better agenda. There are so many youth uh, movements happening that I can tell you about. Like these youth, I've also learned, like these youth, I've also learned in my work that we must listen to frontline communities and indigenous women and other feminist leadership who carry the knowledge and expertise necessary for real climate action, action solutions and adaptation. They have a sacred responsibility to protect Mother Earth. And globally, these women are leading community-led solutions that promote food sovereignty, halt fossil fuel infrastructure, they build clean energy, they advocate for the rights of nature, they fight for indigenous rights, shaping emerging feminist economies, and they protect forests and biodiverse ecosystems. I'm going to show a clip now from Elder Doreen Bernard from the grassroots grandmothers who were protesting along the river or leading a resistance there. You can watch the film in high speed. <laughs> Take it all in. <laughs> OK, we're getting there. I'm doing this the real renegade way, excuse me lack of professionalism. The media fellows didn't train me very well, I guess. <laughs> to leave there, not here. We don't want them here. Now you see that this not only happens here, it happens in every part of the world. Every part of the world. When you look at where industry is affecting the lives of people, those are indigenous people from those lands. And those corporations, majority of them, are Canadian companies. And they have the power to have people killed. They have had the power to assassinate grandmothers and kill the people that are standing in front of their gates. I said, we're doing the same thing as what they did in Guatemala, standing in front of a corporation, and people have been killed there. So we're less visible, they would knock us off too. Yeah. They are knocking us off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at the numbers on the missing and murdered indigenous women. Yeah, they have been no, right. killing our women. Our truth is that uh, we don't have a choice. This is who we are, and this is who we're, we are always meant to be. It's in our DNA, it's in our blood. They cannot stop us from being indigenous anymore. They, they cannot stop us from learning to how to take care of the earth, what our relationship is. 
and it cannot stop us from teaching not only our children, but everybody's children. The prophecy that we're taught was that we didn't start taking care of our, of our, um, of our Mother Earth, our lands and our waters, our food and our medicines, and the animals and the flowers and anything that sustains us. One day, an ounce of water is going to cost more than an ounce of gold. It says that no matter how much money you have, you're not going to be able to buy that ounce of water because of how precious it is. It wouldn't matter if you had gold. Can't drink gold. Can't drink money. So this was a teaching for not only indigenous people. We carry the message. It's for all human beings, all mankind. Every So I learned, I, making the film, I was in close connection with these women and they were so especially influential in, in changing my worldview. And I think I just want to talk about that briefly to kind of close out everything. Unlike the Western viewpoint that the natural world is something that humans can and should dominate profits over people, as we see in this film, we've been indoctrinated in sort of an extinction scarcity narrative. Capitalism attempts to ensure an artificial scarcity of access to essential goods such as housing, healthcare, education, transit, food resources, and so on, that could very, very easily be provided at high quality on a universal public basis. The indigenous worldview centers on that possibility of ab abundance for all to live in harmony with nature, seeing the life on the planet as part of an interconnected whole. Indigenous people believe that they belong to the land they are the land, not, and non-indigenous people believe that the land belongs to them. They're not, they're, they are separate from it. And this is an essential paradigm shift is vital. And many experts are now emphasizing also, finally, that centering indigenous climate knowledge is key. The UN report was also, gave a big report on this very thing, saying that indigenous local knowledge can contribute to effective land management, predictions of natural disasters, and identification of long-term climate changes, and is particularly useful where formal data collection on environmental conditions may be sparse. Some indigenous leaders feel an essential part of the work of the work is regenerating and returning to cultural knowledges and rich cultural spiritual traditions of their ancestors but that were lost in colonization and their land back movement, returning land to the stewardship of indigenous peoples, a rallying cry for dismantling white supremacy and the harms of capitalism is, they say, key to the solution. Excuse me. And as Dr. Waldron and Enrich note, communities will be impacted differently and unequally by climate change based on race, socioeconomic status, class, gender, age, disability, sexuality, and other social identities. Therefore, the climate justice discourse and movement must be premised on an inclusive approach that represents feminist, gendered, anti-racist, and anti-colonial theories. There isn't. Sorry, we will not play that right now. If we want to tell a story of how we work to repair the damage done to the earth, we will be, it will be crucial to also repair the injustices done to racialized and marginalized, marginalized communities, to support and allocate more resources to indigenous, black, brown, LGBTQ, women and youth leaders who are laser focused on just equitable climate solutions based on community needs, we need policymakers to enact bold and transformative policies crafted in deep consultation and partnership there too. This is a story of collective trauma, yes, but also of healing and of real transformation. We all have to be part of the movement also to end white supremacy, which will require to put some of our privilege on the line and take more courageous action. 
to create a new economy that prioritizes the wealth of all, all over the wealth of a few. An economy that doesn't depend on destroying our ecosystems to survive. As the, uh, as Ger Getter, as the Attorney General said earlier, if we can, in the, in the report, if we combine forces now, we can avert climate catastrophe. But as the IPCC report makes clear, there's no time for de delay and there's no room for excuses. Creativity and innovation, imagination, they are crucial for these challenges, as is valuing our intersectionality and solidarity between movements. We need to create creative partnerships and transcend our disciplines and professional silos, since the solutions to the problems or these challenges that I've discussed, they lie in our interdisciplinary collaborations bringing people together from different educations, different backgrounds, different approaches, different philosophies, because we know that our issues are interconnected and liberation must happen collectively. A just, joyful, healthy future requires everyone's hands. We are the, to we are the stories that we tell ourselves. You just need to decide what story you want to tell. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Um, as you can tell, I have not spoken publicly since DePaul. <laughs> so cut me some slack. It's all over the internet. Uh, you know, you have to just read it. For, you can't say all that naturally. So, um, so I guess, did you, what, do you, you want me to stand here and yeah, try to? Yeah, asking you to answer questions. <sighs> God, my boy. They've been making me talk all day. But I still have a little steam. No, look, we have a little. Oh, look, no, we have more. We've got air foam. Um, and Holly, I also want you to maybe say more about your association. Mm. Yeah, you just come up, and then if people can think if they have any questions, and um, yeah, go for it. So, uh, the Native American Indigenous People's Association on campus started in spring 2019, um, and we serve as a space for Indigenous students to connect with one another and build community, but we're also, um, a big part of our mission is education and sharing like our own experiences and cultures uh, with the rest of campus too, and with each other, because it's really interesting to see like all the similarities and differences um, between us. Um, so we're a pretty small group right now. We have about uh, six active members total. Um, that are indigenous students on campus, but we also have a very strong network of faculty and staff support too that we've been really thankful for. Um, and we're also currently working with the DePaul administration as well, which I think is a connection that's vital and that I hope to see um, continue in the future. Uh, for example, we're working on a land acknowledgement right now with DePaul. Um, and the big question coming out of this is how can DePaul actively um, support indigenous students on campus to make this acknowledgement more than just a service level thing? Um, to actually have some action behind it. So that's a big question we're working on now. So if you have any comments or suggestions for that, um, please send them my way or talk to me. Um, I'm really interested in working on this conversation and it's a continued thing that we're working with in the university right now, um, ongoing. So I plan to keep in touch with them even after graduation until I can see things fulfilled with that um, as well. So yeah, since it was fairly new, spring 2019, most of our development happened during the pandemic, which was pretty tough. So um, the biggest thing that you could do to support would be to attend our events, um, come out and like support us on social media, um, as well as spreading the word, because uh, a lot of people on campus still don't know that NAPA exists. So that's really helpful. And I wanted to say thank you to like SLP and the environmental groups at DePaul because we've had, and we've been lucky to work with them a couple of times already. And um, I hope this is something we continue in the future because I find their support like very helpful for us. So. And how do people get a hold of you? I, I oh, yeah. A lot of people are asking me today how to, <laughs> okay. how to reach out, how to cross over. Right. Um, so you can follow us on our Instagram. It's napa underscore depa. Um, but we also just got our own email, which is napa at depa.edu, um, N A I P A um, at depa.edu. So, um, yeah, you can connect us through that, and our future leadership at NAPA will be in touch with you. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I 
I know it's getting uh, past your bedtime, but if you have questions, I'm here. Let me let, me let my hair down. <laughs> oh, you have a comment on my hair? Okay. I have stage moms. Um, does anyone have any anything they want to say? Yes. I want to say yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you, you got to be careful what you say yes to. Uh, um, yes, they can. I don't mean to be rude. I, I mean yes. Um, I hope that I could be of some use or resource for sure. How do you want me to do that? Uh, I don't know. Oh, are you facilitating? You're the middle. Uh, No, that's great. So I'll give you an email. You, I don't know. This, it, you can email me at ianartsian at gmail.com. And I can, you know, you can follow me on social media as well, but that is a way to directly contact me. And I, I am totally open to that in terms of just some of the classes I was talking to today. <clears throat> Excuse me, my gosh. I'm sending you my throat bill. <laughs> <laughs> my larynx bill is expensive. Um, the... Uh, I never, I never took any econ or anything here. I avoided that at all costs. But I was talking to an econ class today, and I do think there was a lot of interest in how to, how to, how to cross over, how to, how to use econ skills, data skills, stats skills, uh, and blend them with storytelling and finding the human aspect of of these things. And so, anything I can do to help bridge, I, I think in a way we are in our silos in these schools which is unfortunate because there's so many beautiful, talented people and professors and resources. And I was saying how just one block seems so far away. I was like, that dining hall seems so far away from my dorm. Um, and then I walked around today, I'm like, that is like a half a block away from where I was living. That is it. So we kind of get stuck in a way. And I think that we can all do a little more to like reach out to other people. I think the work Holly and and your group is doing such amazing work. It's brand new. Um, reach out. I think there are just so many resources and connections that can be happening. So if I can help facilitate that, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I gave a monologue aside from that, but. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Ian Arts. Ian. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. How does, um, I teach a little bit of a science teacher question. It seems really like a simple one, and I just wonder what the answer is. How does building a new well in an area that is polluted underground, how does that help us? That's your question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what? I was talking to Luis last night, and I, I just got that update, like, as I got in last night, because it's kind of a new update. And I wanted to ask that, but I thought, you know what? I'm not going to ask it, because I didn't want to push it. <laughs> but damn it, why didn't I? The one question they ask me, I don't have an answer for. You know what? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to, to be honest, they have so many experts in the area working on this. It's not just some, I'm sure, some sloppy arrangement. Not saying that you're saying that, but I think that I just trusted that they were doing the work to know to prevent that. But I think that is a great question. And email me for a follow-up. Yeah. yeah. Just asking 
Does anyone have an answer to that question? <laughs> um, I will not answer that irresponsibly, in fact, Ethel. Although a great question, I don't really know the mechanics of like what you know economically it would take to. And I think that's a great question because we talk often about like dismantling and upending and what's it going to be. And I'm no expert in the field for how we're actually. There are other, I, I would hope, real experts in ecological uh, disasters and the future. Um, anyone have any input on that? <laughs> I just don't want to answer it irresponsibly, which like it sounds like something has to something has to kind of fall apart to get rebuilt, right? Spiritually, psychologically. For me to have a spiritual transformation, I have to have a breakdown in a way. That's kind of how we have our have our transformation. So I'm going to apply that there. But maybe some sort of utter um, true fall to the bottom, fall into nothingness is needed to for things to be rebuilt. Because the, as you see, it's so systemic. All these issues. It's so ingrained in our psyches and our in our spirits, in our, in our institutions, it's really hard to just like jump out of it. And I think we're not working nearly as hard as we should be in trying to obviously move the pendulum there. And these kinds of, kinds of conversations do help, but I often feel a little bit like, um, not am I making sense, but am I even making, am I making sense? How does this actually work? And for me, it's through all I see is that these communities were changed by spreading, spreading the word. Um, but do we need more, more economic fallout? Or I do not know. Ethel, don't raise your hand again. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> this better be different. No, sorry. <laughs> Ethel, we love you. No, that, yeah, great question. <laughs> Wow. No, I have not been. <laughs> sorry, I'm uh, unhinged. Uh, no, I have not been speaking at a lot of schools. I do know the film was shown a lot in Canada and a lot of schools there. And I think I missed the opportunity. That's why this is the guinea pig moment. Thank you. Um, that missed a lot of opportunities to sort of have us all talk about the film because of COVID, which is a little unfortunate because it's so amazing to see these women in person talking about their communities. Um, but I will say that I, I don't really know what De, is this about. Oh, this is about DePaul, right? What can you be implementing? And what did I say? I, I think that there could be more. Um, I think that there probably should be a, an indigenous knowledge center. I don't know, Holly, you tell me as well what you think would be a, an appropriate space for indigenous voices, right? To to be centered, to get resources, to have their own. And we, uh, we're preaching in this that the, there needs to be a whole environmental shift, a whole paradigm shift. So we need, not necessarily, I think that a lot of people are saying, I don't want to be included in the institution per se, because we'll create our own way of doing things. And we can't be involved in a sort of already white supremacist institution. But if, if, if an institution wants to do more, I think it is giving more space to indigenous knowledge and spirit, uh, indigenous students. Um, I think that there should definitely be more scholarship money there, full rides all around to the marginalized people that go to the school if it's not already happening. We need to get out the checkbooks and make it happen. Um, and in general, I know one school can't do it all, but I would like to see sort of more spirituality, uh, just a sort of all-encompassing spirituality included that might be here. I just sort of see a lot of churches around that I didn't recognize when I was here. But <laughs> I was jogging. I'm like, there is a church on every corner. Uh, but is there spirituality, right? Is there is there depth to our is there depth to our connectivity? How do we? Maybe there's a way to find like a, I, I think groups that could medium our connectivity to one another. I'm just kind of getting a sense that there are there's a lot of separation happening on these campuses. So maybe more about policy. And I know that was driven in about going to Harvard. But I, I did decide, because in a way, I felt kind of an unlikely candidate to be studying policy. I'm a little more creative and renegade and all these things. But I learned in the film that 
you need policy to make real changes on the ground. You need to be able to impact policy. And policy as a term was just not, did not sound fun to me, just like econ. <laughs> and I'm learning that the things that I found to be really boring are where I need to kind of put my fears aside and lean into those things that sound kind of crunchy or too much for me. Um, and I think that policy is where where just so many things can happen in the local environment. So the more you can know how politicians make decisions, how to upend those those decisions, how to get your voice heard in the room is really important. So more policy, never th more creativity, <laughs> more imagination. I mean, really more poetry. And as much as I talk about social justice issues, I love poetry. I love actual poetry itself as an art form, but poetry of living, poetry of being. Um, and I think that we need to remember, I, sorry, I'm on a tangent now, but part of this is we have to remember the joy in all of, all of these people have so much joy and perseverance and um, just so much beauty that they're also sharing. I was talking to Luis on the phone, I'm like, gosh, it, it all you talk, how, it, we were laughing, you know, just what a beautiful laugh, but it's, all of her life now is talking about the dump in her community. This amazing light of the world, right? And this is the, the destiny for now, to talk about the well and get the light out that way. But that's what a misfortune that this person is only talking about the devastation in their community and not about all the other beautiful things that they have to offer. And that does not sit right with me. Um, so remembering that there is still joy and poetry and um, sometimes we need to rest and sometimes we need peace and sometimes we need total upheaval and we need people out on the streets actually with human power getting things done. So it's a combination of all those things. It's very holistic, I think. Not that, uh, not that the student asked that, but. Um, Anything else? Yes. Wow, the internets are popping tonight. <laughs> uh, they said thank you. Um, and then, aside from your own filmography, do you have any other recommendations for films, videos, documentaries, or books to learn more about the topics discussed tonight? Yeah, documentaries I've not been so in the loop on, unfortunately. Maybe in, a long time ago, so maybe other people know. Um, I've been reading so much research, so I'll just give some names. Dr. Boulard is, he spoke here actually on Earth Week, and he's an icon really in the environmental justice movement. And he's just done so much, of, he's an amazing speaker too, I find. And he has so many books about environmental racism in America and all over the country, a lot in Texas. So I would find his books. There's a scholar, Laura uh, Padillo, I believe, excuse me if I'm saying that incorrectly, in Los Angeles, who has a lot of literature. Um, who else do I want to say? Excuse me here, I'm coming up with the thoughts. Um, I follow a lot of indigenous organizations like I Indian Movement is doing a lot on Twitter that I would follow. You're just There's just actually so much research online. It's I, I don't mean to sound uh, sassy when I say Google it, right? But there, there, if, you, if you Google environmental racism in America, there's so much amazing literature right at your fingertips. And also, uh, there, if, you, if you start looking more into indigenous sovereignty, indigenous knowledge and climate change, there are so many amazing groups that are doing this work already, have tons of PDFs of their work, and I, you know, I would like to do all I can to start getting that work out there, but email me at ianartsian at gmail.com and I'll give you more. Anyone in the room? Oh, oh and the, oh. The, the, the DePaul Library has an Earth Day or an Earth Month uh, live guide, a library guide, and it's super helpful. Uh, it's got tons of resources, films, uh, so that, that wouldn't be a bad way. Be, beyond, I mean, I'm with you, Google, Google's a great way, but, but uh, we, we have librarians on campus who have actually sort of done, done, some, done some really good work for us, and it's, it's right there. Yeah, I mean, you know, seek out more than Google, uh, of course. 
there's so much amazing scholarship on this. It's really fascinating. I mean, that was the, the journey we just went on was trying to like really siphon through so much amazing literature. So, so much has been happening. And I think that um, so many people have been speaking up. And it's not, you know, to some people are just discovering it. That's okay. But the time is now. The time is now for sure.